Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to three new members of our Patreon, Polly, Megan, and Jamie. Thank you all so much for becoming supporters of this podcast. Your help makes it possible and keeps it ad-free for everyone, and it's much appreciated. If you're interested in becoming a supporter of this podcast yourself, you'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description. And just a reminder, everyone supporting us in October will be receiving a full recording of the book we're finishing this week as our thanks for your help. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight we're relaxing with the third and final part of Edinburgh, Picturesque Notes by Robert Louis Stevenson first published in 1878 and reprinted as the People's Edition by Seely & Co. Limited, 38 Great Russell Street, London. Let's pick up where we left off. Chapter 7. The Villa Quarters Mr. Ruskin's denunciation of the new town of Edinburgh includes, as I have heard it repeated, nearly all the stone and lime we have to show. Many, however, find a grand air and something settled and imposing in the better parts. And upon many, as I have said, the confusion of styles induces an agreeable stimulation of the mind. But upon the subject of our recent villa architecture, I am frankly ready to mingle my tears with Mr. Ruskin's, and it is a subject which makes one envious of his large declamatory and controversial eloquence. Day by day, one new villa, one new object of offense, is added to another. All around Newington and Morningside, the dismalest structures keep springing up like mushrooms. The pleasant hills are loaded with them, each impudently squatted in its garden, each roofed and carrying chimneys like a house. And yet a glance of an eye discovers their true character. They are not houses, for they were not designed with a view to human habitation and the internal arrangements are, as they tell me, fantastically unsuited to the needs of man. They are not buildings, for you can scarcely say a thing is built where every measurement is in climate disproportion with its neighbor. They belong to no style of art, only to a form of business much to be regretted. Why should it be cheaper to erect a structure where the size of the windows bears no rational relation to the size of the front? Is there any profit in a misplaced chimney stalk? Does a hard-working, greedy builder gain more on a monstrosity than on a decent cottage of equal plainness? Frankly, we should say no. Bricks may be omitted, and green timber employed in the construction of even a very elegant design, and there is no reason why a chimney should be made to vent, because it is so situated as to look comely from without. On the other hand, there is a noble way of being ugly, a high-aspiring fiasco like the fall of Lucifer, 
There are daring and gaudy buildings that manage to be offensive without being contemptible. And we know that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. But to aim at making a commonplace villa and to make it insufferably ugly in each particular, to attempt the homeliest achievement and to attain the bottom of derided failure, not to have any theory but profit, and yet at an equal expense, to outstrip all competitors in the art of conceiving and rendering permanent deformity, and to do all this in what is, by nature, one of the most agreeable neighborhoods in Britain, what are we to say? but that this also is a distinction hard to earn, although not greatly worshipful. Indifferent buildings give pain to the sensitive, but these things offend the plainest taste. It is a danger which threatens the amenity of the town, and as this eruption keeps spreading on our borders, we have ever the farther to walk, among unpleasant sights, before we gain the country air. If the population of Edinburgh were a living, autonomous body, it would arise like one man and make night hideous with arson. The builders and their accomplices would be driven to work with the trowel in one hand and the defensive cutlass in the other and as soon as one of these Masonic wonders had been consummated, right-minded iconoclasts should fall thereon and make an end of it at once. Possibly these words may meet the eye of a builder or two. It is no use asking them to employ an architect, for that would be to touch them in a delicate quarter, and its use would largely depend on what architect they were minded to call in. But let them get any architect in the world to point out any reasonably well-proportioned villa, not his own design, and let them reproduce that model. Chapter 8. The Calton Hill the east of New Edinburgh is guarded by a craggy hill of no great elevation which the town embraces. The old London road runs on one side of it, while the new approach, leaving it on the other hand, completes the circuit. You mount by stairs in a cutting of the rock to find yourself in a field of monuments. Dougal Stewart has the honors of situation and architecture. Burns is memorialized lower down upon a spur. Lord Nelson, as befits a sailor, gives his name to the top gallant of the Calton Hill. This latter erection has been differently, and yet in both cases aptly compared, to a telescope and a butter churn. Comparisons apart, it ranks among the vilest of men's handiworks. But the chief feature is an unfinished range of columns, the modern ruin, as it has been called, an imposing object from far and near, and giving Edinburgh, even from the sea, that false air of a modern Athens, which has earned for her so many slighting speeches. It was meant to be a national monument, and its present state is a very suitable monument to certain national characteristics. The old observatory, a quaint brown building on the edge of the steep, and the new observatory, a classical edifice with a dome, occupy the central portion of the summit. All these are scattered on a green turf, browsed over by some sheep. The scene suggests reflections on fame and on man's injustice to the dead. 
you see Dougald Stewart rather more handsomely commemorated than Burns. Immediately below, in the Canongate churchyard, lies Robert Ferguson, Burns' master in his art, who died insane while yet a stripling. And if Dougald Stewart has been somewhat too boisterously acclaimed, the Edinburgh poet, on the other hand, is most unrighteously forgotten. The votaries of Burns, a crew too common in all ranks in Scotland, and more remarkable for number than discretion, eagerly suppress all mention of the lad who handed to him the poetic impulse and up to the time when he grew famous, continued to influence him in his manner and the choice of subjects. Burns himself not only acknowledged his debt in a fragment of autobiography, but erected a tomb over the grave in Canongate churchyard. This was worthy of an artist, but it was done in vain, and although I think I have read nearly all the biographies of Burns, I cannot remember one in which the modesty of nature was not violated, or where Ferguson was not sacrificed to the credit of his follower's originality. There is a kind of gaping admiration that would fain roll Shakespeare and Bacon into one to have a bigger thing to gape at, and a class of men who cannot edit one author without disparaging all others. They are indeed mistaken if they think to please the great originals, and whoever puts Ferguson right with fame cannot do better than dedicate his labors to the memory of Burns, who will be the best delighted of the dead. Of all places for a view, this Colton Hill is perhaps the best, since you can see the castle, which you lose from the castle and Arthur's Seat, which you cannot see from Arthur's Seat. It is the place to stroll on one of those days of sunshine and east wind, which are so common in our more than temperate summer. The breeze comes off the sea with a little of the freshness and that touch of chill peculiar to the quarter which is delightful to certain very ruddy organizations, and greatly the reverse to the majority of mankind. It brings with it a faint, floating haze, a cunning decolorizer, although not thick enough to obscure outlines near at hand. But the haze lies more thickly to windward, at the far end of Musselboro Bay, and over the links of Aberlady and Berwick Law, and the hump of the Bass Rock, it assumes the aspect of a bank of thin sea fog. Immediately underneath, upon the south, you command the yards of the high school, and the towers and courts of the new jail, a large place, castellated to the extent of folly, standing by itself on the edge of a steep cliff and often joyfully hailed by tourists as the castle. In the one you may perhaps see female prisoners, taking exercise like a string of nuns. In the other, schoolboys running at play, and their shadows keeping step with them. From the bottom of the valley, a gigantic chimney rises almost to the level of the eye, a taller and a shapelier edifice than Nelson's monument. Look a little farther, and there is Holyrood Palace, with its gothic frontal and ruined abbey, and the red sentry pacing smartly to and fro before the door like a mechanical figure in a panorama. By way of an outpost, you can single out the little peak-roofed lodge over which Rizzio's murderers made their escape, and where Queen Mary herself, according to gossip, bathed in white wine to entertain her loveliness. Behind and overhead lie the Queen's Park, from Musket's Cairn to Dumbydykes, St. Margaret's Lock, 
and the long wall of Salisbury Crags, and thence by knoll and rocky bulwark and precipitous slope the eye rises to the top of Arthur's seat, a hill for magnitude, a mountain in virtue of its bold design. This upon your left. Upon the right, the roofs and spires of the old town climb one above another to where the citadel prints its broad bulk and jagged crown of bastions on the western sky. Perhaps it is now one in the afternoon, and at the same instant of time a ball rises to the summit of Nelson's flagstaff close at hand, and far away a puff of smoke, followed by a report, bursts from the half-moon battery at the castle. This is the time gun by which people set their watches, as far as the sea coast, or in hill farms upon the Pentlands. To complete the view, the eye and Falad's Prince's Street, black with traffic, and has a broad look over the valley between the old town and the new, here full of railway trains, and stepped over by the high north bridge upon its many columns, and there green with trees and gardens. On the north, the Galton Hill is neither so abrupt in itself, nor has it so exceptional an outlook, and yet even here it commands a striking aspect. A gully separates it from the new town. This is Greenside, where witches were burned and tournaments held in former days. Down that almost precipitous bank, Bothell launched his horse, and so first, as they say, attracted the bright eyes of Mary. It is now tessellated with sheets and blankets out to dry, and the sound of people beating carpets is rarely absent. Beyond all this, the suburbs run out to Leith. Leith camps on the seaside with her forest of masts. Leith roads are full of ships at anchor. The sun picks out the white pharos upon Inchkeith Island. The firth extends on either hand, from the ferry to the may. The towns of Fifeshire sit, each in its bank of blowing smoke along the opposite coast and the hills enclose the view except to the farthest east, where the haze of the horizon rests upon the open sea. There lies the road to Norway, a dear road for Sir Patrick Spens and his Scots lords, and yonder smoke on the hither side of Largo Law is Aberdour, from whence they sailed to seek a queen for Scotland. The sight of the sea, even from a city, will bring thoughts of storm and sea disaster. The sailors' wives of Leith and the fisherwomen of Kakenzi, not sitting languorously with fans, but crowding to the tail of the harbor with a shawl about their ears, may still look vainly for brave Scotsmen who will return no more or boats that have gone on their last fishing. Since Sir Patrick sailed from Aberdour, what a multitude have gone down in the North Sea. Yonder is Old Home, where the London smack went ashore and wreckers cut the rings from ladies' fingers, and a few miles round Fifeness is the fatal Inch Cape, now a star of guidance and the lee shore to the east of Inch Cape is that Forfarshire coast where Mucklebacket sorrowed for his son. These are the main features of the scene roughly sketched. How they are all tilted by the inclination of the ground, how each stands out in delicate relief against the rest. What manifold detail 
and play of sun and shadow animate and accentuate the picture is a matter for a person on the spot, and turning swiftly on his heels to grasp and bind together in one comprehensive look. It is the character of such a prospect to be full of change and of things moving. The multiplicity embarrasses the eye, and the mind among so much suffers itself to grow absorbed with single points. You remark a tree in a hedgerow, or follow a cart along a country road. You turn to the city and see children, dwarfed by distance into pygmies, at play about suburban doorsteps. You have a glimpse upon a thoroughfare where people are densely moving. You note ridge after ridge of chimney stacks, running downhill one behind another, and church spires rising bravely from the sea of roofs. At one of the innumerable windows you watch a figure moving. On one of the multitude of roofs you watch clambering chimney sweeps. The wind takes a run and scatters the smoke. Bells are heard far and near, faint and loud, to tell the hour. Or perhaps a bird goes dipping evenly over the housetops, like a gull across the waves. And here you are, in the meantime, on this pastoral hillside, among nibbling sheep, and looked upon by monumental buildings. Return thither on some clear, dark, moonless night, with a ring of frost in the air, and only a star or two set sparsely in the vault of heaven, and you will find a sight as stimulating as the hoariest summit of the Alps. The solitude seems perfect, the patient astronomer, flat on his back under the observatory dome, and spying heaven's secrets, is your only neighbor. And yet, from all round you there, come up the dull hum of the city, the tramp of countless people marching out of time, the rattle of carriages, and the continuous keen jingle of the tramway bells. An hour or so before, the gas was turned on. Lamplighters scoured the city. In every house, from kitchen to attic, the windows kindled and gleamed forth into the dusk. And so now, although the town lies blue and darkling on her hills, innumerable spots of the bright element shine far and near along the pavements and upon the high facades. Moving lights of the railway pass and repass below the stationary lights upon the bridge. Lights burn in the jail. Lights burn high up in the tall lands and on the castle turrets. They burn low down in Greenside or along the park. They run out one beyond the other into the dark country. They walk in a procession down to Leith and shine singly far along Leith Pier. Thus the plan of the city and her suburbs is mapped out upon the ground of blackness, as when a child pricks a drawing full of pinholes and exposes it before a candle. Not the darkest night of winter can conceal her high station and fanciful design. Every evening in the year, she proceeds to illuminate herself in honor of her own beauty. And as if to complete the scheme, or rather as if some prodigal pharaoh were beginning to extend to the adjacent sea and country, halfway over to Fife, there is an outpost of light upon Inchkeith, and far to seaward, yet another on the May. 
And while you are looking across upon the castle hill, the drums and bugles begin to recall the scattered garrison. The air thrills with the sound. The bugles sing aloud, and the last rising flourish mounts and melts into the darkness like a star. A martial swan song, fitly rounding in the labors of the day. Chapter 9 Winter and New Year the Scotch dialect is singularly rich in terms of reproach against the winter wind. Snell, Blay, Nurley, and Scowthrin are four of these significant vocables. They are all words that carry a shiver with them, and for my part, as I see them aligned before me on the page, I am persuaded that a big wind comes tearing over the firth from Burnt Island and the northern hills. I think I can hear it howl in the chimney, and as I set my face northwards, feel its smarting kisses on my cheek. Even in the names of places, there is often a desolate, inhospitable sound, and I remember too from the near neighborhood of Edinburgh, called Haim, and blah weary that would promise but starving comfort to their inhabitants. The inclemency of heaven, which has thus endowed the language of Scotland with words, has also largely modified the spirit of its poetry. Both poverty and a northern climate teach men the love of the hearth and the sentiment of the family and the latter, in its own right, inclines a poet to the praise of strong waters. In Scotland, all our singers have a stave or two for blazing fires and stout potations. To get indoors out of the wind and to swallow something hot to the stomach are benefits so easily appreciated where they dwelt. And this is not only so in country districts where the shepherd must wade in the snow all day after his flock, but in Edinburgh itself, and nowhere more apparently stated than in the works of our Edinburgh poet, Ferguson. He was a delicate youth, I take it, and willingly slunk from the robustious winter to an inn fireside. Love was absent from his life, or only present, if you prefer, in such a form that even the least serious of Burns's amorettes was ennobling by comparison. And so there is nothing to temper the sentiment of indoor revelry, which pervades the poor boy's verses. Although it is characteristic of his native town, and the manners of its youth to the present day, this spirit has perhaps done something to restrict his popularity. He recalls a supper-party pleasantry with something akin to tenderness, and sounds the praises of the act of drinking as if it were virtuous, or at least witty in itself. The kindly jar the warm atmosphere of tavern parlors, and the revelry of lawyers' clerks do not offer by themselves the materials of a rich existence. It was not choice so much as an external fame that kept Ferguson in this round of sordid pleasures. A Scot of poetic temperament and without religious exaltation drops as if by nature into the public house. The picture may not be pleasing, but what else is a man to do in this dog's weather? To none but those who have themselves suffered the thing in the body can the gloom and depression of our Edinburgh winter be brought home. For some constitutions, there is something almost physically disgusting 
in the bleak ugliness of easterly weather. The wind wearies, the sickly sky depresses them, and they turn back from their walk to avoid the aspect of the unrefulgent sun going down among perturbed and pallid mists. The days are so short that a man does much of his business and certainly all of his pleasure by the haggard glare of gas lamps. The roads are as heavy as a fallow. People go by so drenched and draggle-tailed that I have often wondered how they found the heart to undress. And meantime the wind whistles through the town as if it were an open meadow. And if you lie awake all night, you hear it shrieking and raving overhead with the noise of shipwrecks and of falling houses. In a word, life is so unsightly that there are times when the heart turns sick in a man's inside, and the look of a tavern or the thought of the warm, firelit study is like the touch of land to one who has been long struggling with the seas. As the weather hardens towards frost, the world begins to improve for Edinburgh people. We enjoy superb, subarctic sunsets, with the profile of the city stamped in indigo upon a sky of luminous green. The wind may still be cold, but there is a briskness in the air that stirs good blood. People do not all look equally sour and downcast. They fall into two divisions. One, the knight of the blue face and hollow paunch, whom winter has gotten by the vitals. The other, lined with New Year's fair, conscious of the touch of cold on his periphery, but stepping through it by the glow of his internal fires. Such a one, I remember, triply cased in grease, whom no extremity of temperature could vanquish. Well, would be his jovial salutation, here's a sneezer. And the look of these warm fellows is tonic, and upholds their drooping fellow townsmen. There is yet another class who do not depend on corporeal advantages, but support the winter in virtue of a brave and merry heart. One shivering evening, cold enough for frost, but with too high a wind, and a little past sundown, when the lamps were beginning to enlarge their circles in the growing dusk, a brace of barefoot lassies were seen coming eastward in the teeth of the wind. If the one was as much as nine, the other was certainly not more than seven. They were miserably clad, and the pavement was so cold you could have thought no one could lay a naked foot on it unflinching. Yet they came along waltzing, if you please while the elder sang a tune to give them music. The person who saw this, and whose heart was full of bitterness at the moment, pocketed a reproof which has been of use to him ever since, and which he now hands on with his good wishes to the reader. At length, Edinburgh, with her satellite hills and all the sloping country, are sheeted up in white. If it has happened in the dark hours, nurses pluck their children out of bed and run with them to some commanding window whence they may see the change that has been worked upon earth's face. All the hills are covered with snow, they sing, and winters now come fairly. And the children marveling at the silence and the white landscape, find a spell appropriate to the season in the words. 
The reverberation of the snow increases the pale daylight and brings all objects nearer the eye. The pentlands are smooth and glittering, with here and there the black ribbon of a dry stone dike, and here and there, if there be wind, a cloud of blowing snow upon a shoulder. The firth seems a leaden creek that a man might almost jump across between well-powdered Lothian and well-powdered Fife. And the effect is not, as in other cities, a thing of half a day. The streets are soon trodden black, but the country keeps its virgin white, and you have only to lift your eyes and look over miles of country snow. An indescribable cheerfulness breathes out about the city, and the well-fed heart sits lightly and beats gaily in the bosom. It is New Year's weather. New Year's Day, the great national festival, is a time of family expansions and of deep carousal. Sometimes, by a sore stroke of fate for this Calvinistic people, the year's anniversary falls upon a Sunday when the public houses are inexorably closed, when singing and even whistling is banished from our homes and highways, and the oldest toper feels called upon to go to church. Thus pulled about, as if between two loyalties, the Scotch have to decide many nice cases of conscience, and ride the marches narrowly between the weekly and the annual observance. A party of convivial musicians, next door to a friend of mine, hung suspended in this manner on the brink of their diversions. From ten o'clock on Sunday night, my friend heard them tuning their instruments, and as the hour of liberty drew near, each must have had his music open, his bow in readiness across the fiddle, his foot already raised to mark the time, and his nerves braced for execution for hardly had the twelfth stroke sounded from the earliest steeple before they had launched forth into a secular bravura. Currant loaf is now popular eating in all households. For weeks before the great morning, confectioners display stacks of scotch buns, a dense black substance inimical to life, and full moons of shortbread, adorned with mottoes of peel or sugar plum, in honor of the season and the family affections. Can you not see the carrier, after half a day's journey on pinching hill roads, draw up before a cottage in Teviotdale, or perhaps the manor glen among the rowans, and the old people receiving the parcel, with moist eyes and a prayer for Jock or Jean in the city. For at this season, on the threshold of another year of calamity and stubborn conflict, men feel a need to draw closer the links that unite them. They reckon the number of their friends, like allies before a war, and the prayers grow longer in the morning, as the absent are recommended by name into God's keeping. On the day itself, the shops are all shut as on a Sunday. Only taverns, toy shops, and other holiday magazines keep doors open. Everyone looks for his handsaw. The postman and the lamplighters have left, at every house in their districts, a copy of vernacular verses asking and thanking in a breath. And it is characteristic of Scotland that these verses may have sometimes a touch of reality in detail or sentiment, and a measure of strength in the handling. 
All over the town, you may see comforted schoolboys hasting to squander their half-crowns. There are an infinity of visits to be paid. All the world is in the street, except the daintier classes. The sacramental greeting is heard upon all sides. Old Lang Syne is much in people's mouths and whiskey and shortbread are staple articles of consumption. From an early hour, a stranger will be impressed by the number of drunken men, and by afternoon, drunkenness has spread to the women. With some classes of society, it is as much a matter of duty to drink hard on New Year's Day as to go to church on Sunday. Some have been saving their wages for perhaps a month to do the season honor. Many carry a whiskey bottle in their pocket, which they will press with embarrassing effusion upon a perfect stranger. It is inexpedient to risk one's body in a cab, or not at least until after a prolonged study of the driver. The streets, which are thronged from end to end, become a place for delicate pilotage. Singly or arm in arm, some speechless, others noisy and quarrelsome, the votaries of the new year go meandering in and out and cannoning one against another, and now and again one falls and lies as he has fallen, before night, so many have gone to bed or the police office that the streets seem almost clearer, and as guisards and first-footers are now not much seen except in country places, when once the new year has been rung in and proclaimed at the Tron railing, the festivities begin to find their way indoors and something like quiet returns upon the town. But think, in these piled lands, of all the senseless snorers, all the broken heads and empty pockets. Of old, Edinburgh University was the scene of heroic snowballing, and one riot obtained the epic honors of military intervention. But the great generation, I am afraid, is at an end, and even during my own college days the spirit appreciably declined. Skating and sliding, on the other hand, are honored more and more, and curling, being a creature of the national genius, is little likely to be disregarded. The patriotism that leads a man to eat scotch bun will scarce desert him at the curling pond. Many a happy urchin can slide the whole way to school, and the profession of errand boy is transformed into a holiday amusement. As for skating, there is scarce any city so handsomely provided. Duddingston Loch lies under the abrupt southern side of Arthur's seat. In summer, a shield of blue, with swans sailing from the reeds. In winter, a field of ringing ice. The village church sits above it on a green promontory, and the village smoke rises from among goodly trees. At the church gates is the historical jug, a place of penance for the neck of detected sinners, and the historical looping-on stain from which Dutch-built lairds and farmers climbed into the saddle. Here Prince Charlie slept before the Battle of Preston Pans, and here Deacon Brody, or one of his gang, stole a plow coulter before the burglary in Chessel's Court. On the opposite side of the loch, the ground rises to Craig Miller Castle, 
a place friendly to Stuart Merriellotters. It is worth a climb, even in summer, to look down upon the loch from Arthur's seat, but it is tenfold more so on a day of skating. The surface is thick with people moving easily and swiftly and leaning over at a thousand graceful inclinations. The crowd opens and closes and keeps moving through itself like water, and the ice rings to half a mile away with the flying steel. As night draws on, the single figures melt into the dusk until only an obscure stir and coming and going of black clusters is visible upon the loch. A little longer and the first torch is kindled and begins to flit rapidly across the ice in a ring of yellow reflection and this is followed by another and another until the whole field is full of skimming lights. Chapter 10 To the Pentland Hills On three sides of Edinburgh, the country slopes downward from the city, here to the sea, there to the fat farms of Haddington, there to the mineral fields of Linlithgow. On the south alone, it keeps rising until it not only outtops the castle, but looks down on Arthur's seat. The character of the neighborhood is pretty strongly marked by a scarcity of hedges, by many stone walls of varying height, by a fair amount of timber, some of it well-grown, but apt to be of a bushy northern profile and poor in foliage, by here and there a little river, esk or leith or almond, busily journeying in the bottom of its glen, and from almost every point, by a peep of the sea or the hills. There is no lack of variety, and yet most of the elements are common to all parts, and the southern district is alone distinguished by considerable summits and a wide view. From Borough Muirhead, where the Scottish army encamped before Flodden, the road descends a long hill, at the bottom of which, and just as it is preparing to mount upon the other side, it passes a toll bar and issues at once into the open country. Even as I write these words, they are being antiquated in the progress of events, and the chisels are tinkling on a new row of houses. The builders have at length adventured beyond the toll which held them in respect so long, and proceed to career in these fresh pastures like a herd of colts turned loose. And here, appropriately enough, there stood in old days a crow-haunted gibbet, with two bodies hanged in chains. I used to be shown, when a child, a flat stone in the roadway to which the gibbet had been fixed. People of a willing fancy were persuaded, and sought to persuade others, that this stone was never dry, and no wonder they would add for the two men had only stolen fourpence between them. For about two miles the road climbs upwards, a long, hot walk in summertime. You reach the summit at a place where four ways meet, beside the toll of Fair Mile Head. The spot is breezy and agreeable both in name and aspect. The hills are close by across a valley. Kirk Yetton, with its long, upright scars visible as far as Fife, with wood and tilled field running high upon their borders, and haunches all molded into innumerable glens and shelvings, and variegated with heather and fern. The air comes briskly and sweetly off the hills, 
pure from the elevation and rustically scented by the upland plants. And even at the toll, you may hear the curlew calling on its mate. At certain seasons, when the gulls desert their surfy forelands, the birds of sea and mountain hunt and scream together in the same field by Fairmile Head. The winged wild things intermix their wheelings. The seabirds skim the treetops and fish among the furrows of the plow. These little craft of air are at home in all the world so long as they cruise in their own element. And like sailors, ask but food and water from the shores they coast. Below, over a stream, the road passes Bow Bridge. Now a dairy farm, but once a distillery of whiskey. It chanced some time in the past century that the distiller was on terms of good fellowship with the visiting officer of excise. The latter was of an easy, friendly disposition and a master of convivial arts. Now and again he had to walk out of Edinburgh to measure the distiller's stock and although it was agreeable to find his business lead him in a friend's direction, it was unfortunate that the friend should be a loser by his visits. Accordingly, when he got about the level of Fairmile Head, the gauger would take his flute, fit it together, and set manfully to playing, as if for his own delectation and inspired by the beauty of the scene, his favorite air, it seems, was over the hills and far away. At the first note, the distiller pricked his ears, a flute at Fairmile Head, and playing over the hills and far away. This must be his friendly enemy, the gauger. Instantly, horses were harnessed, and sundry barrels of whiskey were got upon a cart driven at a gallop round Hill End, and buried in the mossy glen behind Kirk Yetton. In the same breath, you may be sure, a fat fowl was put to the fire, and the whitest napery prepared for the back parlour. A little after, the gauger, having had his fill of music for the moment, came strolling down with the most innocent air imaginable, and found the good people at Bow Bridge taken entirely unawares by his arrival, but none the less glad to see him. The distiller's liquor and the gauger's flute would combine to speed the moments of digestion, and when both were somewhat mellow, they would wind up the evening with over the hills and far away to an accompaniment of knowing glances. And at last, there is a smuggling story with original and half idyllic features. A little further, the road to the right passes an upright stone in a field. The country people call it General Kay's Monument. According to them, an officer of that name had perished there in battle at some indistinct period before the beginning of history. The date is reassuring, for I think cautious writers are silent on the general's exploits. But the stone is connected with one of those remarkable tenures of land which linger on into the modern world from feudalism. Whenever the reigning sovereign passes by, a certain landed proprietor is held bound to climb up to the top, trumpet in hand, and sound a flourish according to the measure of his knowledge in that art. Happily for a respectable family, crowned heads have no great business in the Pentland Hills, but the story lends a character of comicality to the stone, and the passerby will sometimes chuckle to himself. 
the district is dear to the superstitious. Hard by, at the back gate of Cummiston, a belated carter beheld a lady in white, with the most beautiful, clear shoes upon her feet, who looked upon him in a very ghastly manner and then vanished. And just in front is the hunter's tryst, once a roadside inn, and not so long ago haunted by the devil in person. Satan led the inhabitants a pitiful existence. He shook the four corners of the building with lamentable outcries, beat at the doors and windows, overthrew crockery in the dead hours of the morning, and danced unholy dances on the roof. Every kind of spiritual disinfectant was put in requisition. Chosen ministers were summoned out of Edinburgh and prayed by the hour. Highest neighbors sat up all night, making a noise of psalmody. But Satan minded them no more than the wind about the hilltops. And it was only after years of persecution that he left the hunter's tryst in peace to occupy himself with the remainder of mankind. What with General K and the White Lady and this singular visitation, the neighborhood offers great facilities to the makers of sun myths. And without exactly casting in one's lot with that disenchanting school of writers, one cannot help hearing a good deal of the winter wind in the last story. And if people sit up all night in lone places on the hills, with Bibles and tremulous psalms, they will be apt to hear some of the most fiendish noises in the world. The wind will beat on doors and dance upon roofs for them, and make the hills howl around their cottage, with a clamor like the judgment day. The road goes down through another valley, and then finally begins to scale the main slope of the Pentlands. A bouquet of old trees stands round a white farmhouse, and from a neighboring dell you can see smoke rising and leaves ruffling in the breeze. Straight above, the hills climb a thousand feet into the air. The neighborhood, about the time of lambs, is clamorous with the bleating of flocks. And you will be awakened in the gray of early summer mornings by the barking of a dog or the voice of a shepherd shouting to the echoes. This, with the hamlet lying behind unseen, is Swanston. The place in the dell is immediately connected with the city. Long ago, this sheltered field was purchased by the Edinburgh magistrates for the sake of the springs that rise or gather there. After they had built their water house and laid their pipes, it occurred to them that the place was suitable for junketing once entertained with jovial magistrates and public funds, the idea led speedily to accomplishment, and Edinburgh could soon boast of a municipal pleasure house. The dell was turned into a garden, and on the knoll that shelters it from the plain and the sea winds, they built a cottage looking to the hills. They brought crockets and gargoyles from old St. Giles's, which they were then restoring, and disposed them on the gables and over the door and about the garden. And the quarry which had supplied them with building material, they draped with clematis and carpeted with beds of roses. So much for the pleasure of the eye, for creature comfort, they made a capacious cellar in the hillside and fitted it with bins of the hewn stone. In process of time, the trees grew higher and gave shade to the cottage, and the evergreens sprang up and turned the dell into a thicket. 
Their purple magistrates relaxed themselves from the pursuit of municipal ambition. Cocked hats paraded soberly about the garden and in and out among the hollies. Authoritative canes drew ciphering upon the path, and at night, from high upon the hills, a shepherd saw lighted windows through the foliage and heard the voice of city dignitaries raised in song. The farm is older. It was first a grange of White Kirk Abbey, tilled and inhabited by rosy friars. Thence, after the Reformation, it passed into the hands of true blue Protestant family. During the covenanting troubles, when a night conventicle was held upon the Pentlands, the farm door stood hospitably open till the morning. The dresser was laden with cheese and bannocks, milk and brandy, and the worshippers kept slipping down from the hill between two exercises, as couples visit the supper room between two dances of a modern ball. In the forty-five, some foraging Highlanders from Prince Charlie's army fell upon Swanston in the dawn. The great-grandfather of the late farmer was then a little child. Him they awakened by plucking the blankets from his bed, and he remembered when he was an old man their truculent looks and uncouth speech. The churn stood full of cream in the dairy, and with this they made their brose in high delight. It was bra brose, said one of them. At last they made off, laden like camels with their booty, and Swanston Farm has lain out of the way of history from that time forward. I do not know what may yet be in store for it. On dark days, when the mist runs low upon the hill, the house has a gloomy air, as if suitable for private tragedy. But in hot July, you can fancy nothing more perfect than the garden, laid out in alleys and arbors and bright old-fashioned flower plots, and ending in a miniature ravine, all trellis work and moss and tinkling waterfall, and housed from the sun under fathoms of broad foliage. The hamlet behind is one of the least considerable of hamlets, and consists of a few cottages on a green beside a burn. Some of them, a strange thing in Scotland, are models of internal neatness the beds adorned with patchwork, the shelves arrayed with willow pattern plates, the floors and tables bright with scrubbing or pipe clay, and the fairy kettle polished like silver. It is the sign of a contented old age in country places, where there is little matter for gossip and no street sights. Housework becomes an art, and at evening, when the cottage interior shines and twinkles in the glow of a fire, the housewife folds her hands and contemplates her finished picture. The snow and the wind may do their worst. She has made herself a pleasant corner in the world. The city might be a thousand miles away, and yet it was from close by that Mr. Bow painted the distant view of Edinburgh, which has been engraved for this collection, and you have only to look at the etching to see how near it is at hand. But hills and hill people are not easily sophisticated, and if you walk out here on a summer Sunday, it is as like as not the shepherd may set his dogs upon you. But keep an unmoved countenance. They look formidable at the charge, but their hearts are in the right place. And they will only bark and sprawl about you on the grass, 
unmindful of their master's excitations. Kirk Yetten forms the northeastern angle of the range, thence the Pentlands trend off to south and east. From the summit you look over a great expanse of champagne sloping to the sea, and behold a large variety of distant hills. These are the hills of Fife, the hills of Peebles, the Lammermoors, and the Ockles, more or less mountainous in outline, more or less blue with distance. Of the Pentlands themselves you see a field of wild heathery peaks, with a pond gleaming in the midst, and to that side the view is as desolate as if you were looking into Galloway or Applecross. To turn to the other is like a piece of travel. Far out in the lowlands, Edinburgh shows herself, making a great smoke on clear days, and spreading her suburbs about her for miles. The castle rises darkly in the midst, and close by Arthur's seat makes a bold figure in the landscape. All around cultivated fields and woods and smoking villages and white country roads diversify the uneven surface of the land. Trains crawl slowly abroad upon the railway lines. Little ships are tacking in the firth. The shadow of a mountainous cloud, as large as a parish, travels before the wind. The wind itself ruffles the wood and standing corn, and sends pulses of varying color along the landscape. So you sit, like Jupiter upon Olympus, and look down from afar upon men's life. The city is as silent as a city of the dead. From all its humming thoroughfares, not a voice, not a footfall, reaches you upon the hill. The sea surf, the cries of plowmen, the streams and the mill wheels, the birds and the wind, keep up an animated concert through the plain. From farm to farm, dogs and crowing cocks contend together in defiance. And yet, from this Olympian station, except for the whispering rumor of a train, the world has fallen into a dead silence, and the business of town and country grown voiceless in your ears. A crying hill bird, the bleat of a sheep, a wind singing in the dry grass, seem not so much to interrupt as to accompany the stillness. But to the spiritual ear, the whole scene makes a music at once human and rural, and discourses pleasant reflections on the destiny of man. The spiry, habitable city, ships, the divided fields and browsing herds, and the straight highways tell visibly of man's active and comfortable ways, and you may be never so laggard and never so unimpressionable. But there is something in the view that spirits up your blood and puts you in the vein for cheerful labor. Immediately below is Fair Mile Head, a spot of roof and a smoking chimney, where two roads no thicker than pack thread intersect beside a hanging wood. If you are fanciful, you will be reminded of the gauger in the story, and the thought of this old excise man, who once lipped and fingered on his pipe, and uttered clear notes from it in the mountain air, and the words of the song he affected, carry your mind over the hills and far away. And you have a vision of Edinburgh, 
not as you see her in the midst of a little neighborhood, but as a boss upon the round world, with all Europe and the deep sea for her surrounding. For every place is a center to the earth, whence highways radiate or ships set sail for foreign ports. The limit of a parish is not more imaginary than the frontier of an empire, and as a man sitting at home in his cabinet and swiftly writing books, so a city sends abroad an influence and a portrait of herself. There is no Edinburgh emigrant, far or near, from China to Peru, but he or she carries some lively pictures of the mind, some sunset behind the castle cliffs, some snow scene, some maze of city lamps, indelible in the memory and delightful to study in the intervals of toil. For any such, if this book fall in their way, here are a few more home pictures. It would be pleasant indeed if they should recognize a house where they had dwelt, or a walk that they had taken. And with that, we have at last reached the end of Edinburgh Picturesque Notes by Robert Louis Stevenson. I hope you enjoyed that book as much as I did, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on reading a single work in consecutive weeks. I rather enjoyed it, although I do enjoy variety as well. Let me know what you prefer. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or send me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.